What exactly is this kundalini serpent energy that rises up our 33 vertebrae tree of life? And what are these supposed seven chakra wheels of light? What is all this symbolism actually pointing towards? Harajat Khalsa wrote, The ancient yogis and sages who developed kundalini yoga had a deep respect for the creator of this human body. They knew in their profound devotion and worship that so perfect a creator could only have created perfection in design, function, and potential. Based on this respect, they sought knowledge of the totality of the human being. They researched the human ability to maintain good health, increase vitality, open consciousness, and expand the experience of the excellence of human life. Their research gave them a great understanding of the nervous system, glandular system, organ system, energy system, and brain. They learned how blood, nerves, muscles, organs, and glands all work together. They investigated the seen and the unseen, and the interrelationships between the physical and the subtle. From this research, they developed Kundalini Yoga. Kundalini Yoga is a highly evolved technology based on a thorough understanding of the ecology of the human body, how the breath affects the thinking, how the angle of a finger affects the pituitary gland. This technology works with the systems of the human body using the body's own means. Hand position, breath, posture, sound, and motion are employed in various ways to create the optimum balance among all the body's components. Until recent times, these techniques had been secret, taught only to a chosen few. When babies are born, their entire 33 vertebrae spinal column is loose, flexible, and independently operating. By adolescence, however, the first four vertebrae begin fusing into a single unit known as the cossacks, and by early adulthood, the next five vertebrae fully fuse into another single unit known as the sacrum. No longer able to move about freely and independently, various processes of the cerebrospinal system become constricted and deregulated, such as the relaxation response, hormone production, and the flow of spinal fluid. Ancient yogis also taught that the root of individuated consciousness, the divine essence within man, originates at our first chakra point, the perineum, nestled and stuck by the many fused vertebrae. This kundalini energy desires to travel upward along the spine, illuminating the seven chakra centers and resulting in a fully realized, individuated, enlightened being. Since the awakening of kundalini requires extensive initiation, including meditation, breathing practices, advanced stretching, a plant-based diet, chastity, and other austerities, the majority of humanity remains unaware of this powerful, transformative energy to their own physical and spiritual detriment. Kundalini energy desires to climb our trees of life, but finds itself trapped by our fused lower vertebrae. So esotericists have long symbolized this with a serpent coiled around an egg three and a half times. In order to uncoil the serpent from its nest egg and allow kundalini to rise up the tree of life, the initiate must sincerely dedicate themselves to a variety of holistic, healthful practices and self-discovery through asceticism and introspection, which will begin the process of ascension. As kundalini ascends, one by one, the seven main energy centers of the body become illuminated meaning the physiological and psycho-spiritual processes associated with each chakra become optimized. These seven energy centers, all of which are located along the cerebrospinal column, corresponding directly to a major nerve ganglia, endocrine gland, or internal organ, and have actually been measured electromagnetically to produce tenfold stronger biofields than non-chakra points. They each have physiological manifestations related to their location in the physical body, but also extend into the energy body, affecting us emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually as well. Muladhara, the red root chakra, is located in the perineum and relates to the gonads, adrenal medulla, and the pubococcygis muscle that controls ejaculation. Psychologically, the root chakra controls security, survival, and the fight-or-flight response. Swadhisthana, the orange sacral chakra, is located in the sacrum and relates to the testes or ovaries, the genitourinary system, and the adrenals. Psychologically, the sacral chakra controls sexuality, relationships, violence, addictions, pleasure, creativity, and enthusiasm. 
Manapura, the yellow solar plexus chakra, is located in the solar plexus and relates to the metabolic and digestive systems, the pancreas and adrenal cortex. Psychologically, the solar plexus chakra controls power, will, fear, and anxiety. Anahata, the green heart chakra, is located at the thymus in the middle of the chest and relates to the immune, circulatory, and endocrine systems responsible for fending off disease, blood flow, and maturation of T-cells. Psychologically, the heart chakra controls love, compassion, rejection, equilibrium, and well-being. Vishuddha, the blue throat chakra, is located at the thyroid, which produces the thyroid hormone responsible for growth and maturation. Psychologically, the throat chakra is related to communication and growth through expression. Ajna, the indigo third eye chakra, is located at the pineal gland, the precise geometric center of the brain. The pineal gland is light-sensitive and produces melatonin, which regulates sleep and dream states. Psychologically, the third eye chakra is related to intuition and clarity of mind. Sahasrara, the violet crown chakra, is located at the crown of the head and relates to the pituitary gland, which secretes hormones to control the endocrine system and connects to the central nervous system via the hypothalamus. Psychologically, the crown chakra is related to beingness, pure consciousness, and karma. Irvin Laszlo wrote, Of the seven primary chakras that are deemed to mediate the awareness and energies of our personal energy field, five are considered to align primarily along the main meridians up our spine. One is between and slightly above our eye level, and the last sits at the crown of our head. Associated with nerve plexuses and the endocrine system of our bodies, which secretes and regulates hormonal balances, the chakras, as viewed by Eastern traditions, have a primary role in the mediation of consciousness. The electronic recordings of the human biofield were found to be strongest over the chakras. When the signal from the nervous system's alternating field was filtered out, at the frequencies above 500 cycles per second, the continuous low-intensity direct field seem to be around ten times as high as the field through which the body's nervous system is controlled, although its intensity is less than half that of a resting muscle. In the 1990s, scientist Itzhak Bentoff studied kundalini from an engineering perspective and hypothesized that traditional yogic practices were actually advanced methods for stimulating endocrine glands to release higher amounts of hormones, endorphins, and endogenous DMT which directly caused the raising of consciousness. Bentov found the 7.5 Hz oscillation rhythm of the heart affect frequencies in the brain and create the stimulus equivalent of a current loop. In other words, the current homogenizes brain hemisphere activity, which in turn optimizes the secretion and flow of various bodily chemicals and fluids along the cerebrospinal system, causing an upgrade in both health and consciousness. Bentov also theorized that this made the body an effective antenna for the 7.5 Hz frequency, which just so happens to be the resonant frequency of the ionosphere, and could potentially be a mechanism allowing heightened intuition by literally picking up and gleaning information from the ether. Dr. Lee Sanella wrote, A new center, presently dormant in the average man or woman, has to be activated and a more powerful stream of psychic energy must rise into the head from the base of the spine to enable the human consciousness to transcend the normal limits. This is the final phase of the present evolutionary impulse in man. The cerebrospinal system of man has to undergo a radical change, enabling consciousness to transcend the limits of the highest intellect. Here, reason yields to intuition, and revelation appears to guide the steps of humankind. This mechanism, known as Kundalini, is the real cause of all so-called spiritual and psychic phenomena, the biological basis of evolution and development of personality, the secret origin of all esoteric and occult doctrines, the master key to the unsolved mystery of creation, the inexhaustible source of philosophy, art, and science, and the fountainhead of all religious faiths, past, present, and future. Julius Evola wrote, Yoga techniques aim at revealing the spiritual corporeity to a clear and alert consciousness. This involves an expansion of consciousness itself and its development into a superconsciousness that replaces those forms of impaired and dulled consciousness. I would like to suggest at this point 
that some absurd psychoanalytical interpretations of yoga are circulated in the West by people who are extremely ignorant of even the most basic principles of yoga. According to these interpretations, yoga is supposed to induce hypnotic or trance-like states, like those experienced by a medium, that are below rather than above the level of ordinary waking consciousness. Exactly the opposite happens to be true. I have personally been training and teaching various forms of yoga, including kundalini, pranayama, and hatha, for two decades and can attest to the myriad benefits enjoyed by dedicated practitioners. Regular yoga practice has been proven to relieve stress, general body aches, pains, and anxiety, and depression, increase stamina, lung capacity, core strength, mindfulness, mental clarity and focus, improve posture, poise, and patience, promote longevity and cellular regeneration, boost energy levels, elevate mood, release happiness endorphins, improve digestion, assimilation, and elimination, aid in deeper sleep, and elicit the relaxation response. Beyond these benefits gained by practitioners of all forms of yoga, the pinnacle state and intended achievement of the specific discipline known as kundalini yoga is the rising of this energy from the base of the spine to the top of the head in what is termed a kundalini experience, or a kundalini awakening. At the age of 25, after training in yoga for seven years, and during a particularly diligent stint where I was practicing several hours daily, one fateful afternoon, I had the extreme pleasure and privilege of experiencing a kundalini awakening myself. So what is meant by a kundalini experience, or kundalini awakening? Some signs and symptoms of experiencing a typical kundalini awakening include fiery or electrical sensations rising up the spinal column, internal sounds like a hum, buzz, or ringing in one's ears, body shaking, jerking, or convulsions, severe emotional swings from extreme bliss to inconsolable sadness, personal and interpersonal realizations and revelations, visual and auditory hallucinations or hypersensitivities, and waves of intense joy, contentment, and fulfillment. These initial effects of successfully awakening kundalini are short-lived, however, and generally appear and disappear again within a number of hours. Under proper spiritual guidance and with adequate physical preparation, the entire process should be very positive and beneficial, but without the necessary guidance and preparedness, kundalini awakening too early can have detrimental effects as well. Signs and symptoms of premature kundalini awakening include acute pains, fevers or chills, fits and seizures, migraines, respiratory or heart problems, bipolar mood swings, anxiety, fear, and paranoia. Dr. Lawrence Edwards, founder of the Kundalini Support Organization, stated, The purification process of this energy transformation can bring up latent disease, muscle spasms, joint problems, and digestive problems. People can go through all kinds of things, hot flashes and sweats, numbing sensations, all kinds of things that can happen that aren't the most pleasant. Luckily, nowadays, there are dozens of excellent books and countless trained teachers available to safely and effectively guide initiates in the raising of kundalini, so that with adequate preparation, such negative experiences need not be risked or endured. On the contrary, a proper kundalini awakening can and should be one of the most positive, fulfilling, and satisfying experiences ever, with after-effects that last a lifetime. Tantra teacher Kara Lee Grant wrote that, when kundalini awakens, a person may experience deeper empathy with others, and this empathy can almost become telepathic. There is greater sensitivity, higher energy levels, sometimes psychic abilities or deep knowing. Aging can appear to slow down. Creativity and charisma can increase, as can internal peace and knowing. There is a sense of being part of all that is. The greater mysteries of life are no longer mysteries. There are various systems and exercises within kundalini yoga which prepare the body for and aim to induce the kundalini awakening process. Exactly how and when each individual will successfully achieve it depends on several subjective factors, making the journey different for everyone. In general, however, the process takes a number of years and involves advanced stretching, particularly of the spinal column, pranayama deep breathing practices, vipassana meditation, a plant-based diet, water fasting, enemas or colonics, saltwater sinus cleansing with neti pot, 
chastity or complete celibacy, and several other specific austerities and practices. One of the main prerequisites for unlocking kundalini, and the biggest obstacle I have found for most students, is physically stretching, loosening, decompressing, relaxing, and cracking every vertebrae in their spine, and ultimately every joint in their body. In fact, it was through that very pursuit that I personally stumbled upon initiating my own kundalini experience. I had heard of kundalini yoga, and even incorporated some of its techniques into my daily hatha and pranayama practice, but at the time had never heard the term kundalini awakening, or kundalini experience. Thankfully, I actually managed to trigger a complete and safe awakening without any negative consequences and without the guidance of a personal instructor. Since then, I have learned much more about the process and helped many of my own yoga students achieve similar results. During my hatha training, I began noticing that as I stretched and loosened my back through various poses, eventually and inevitably, once each section of my spine had decompressed and relaxed thoroughly enough, I would be rewarded with a new crack, or pop. By this I mean the kind of joint cracking or popping which chiropractic doctors perform on their patients. The difference being that when gradually stretched and loosened over time through yoga until each vertebrae naturally cracks on its own, rather than being forced by a chiropractor, the experience feels like receiving a master key, unlocking a door in your spine, because you gain the ability forever thereafter to comfortably crack each vertebrae yourself. Scientifically speaking, the cracking sound results from releasing synovial gases from articular capsules. Synovial fluid lubricates each joint in the body, and through movement over time causes bubbles of synovial gas to form. When the joint is cracked, the articular capsule is stretched sufficiently to release the gas and allow it to return as synovial fluid. After a few hours, synovial gas bubbles will begin forming again, and the joint can be cracked again. If you have never cracked a joint before, and especially if forced, it can be a fairly unpleasant or even painful experience. But if properly prepared through yogic practice, and allowed to naturally pop through specific poses, cracking your joints is incredibly relaxing and simultaneously invigorating. Conflicting with what your mother may have told you, joint cracking is not unhealthy, nor does it cause any permanent swelling or other problems. Quite the contrary, joint cracking is a very healthful and beneficial practice, especially when each joint is slowly stretched over time until naturally occurring. Nowadays, I personally cannot not crack my joints, because just the act of getting out of bed in the morning causes over a dozen pops sounding like someone setting off fireworks. When I first began practicing yoga, however, I had never even cracked my knuckles before. Once I began receiving the skeleton keys to unlock each joint, I really enjoyed the subtle relaxing energy pulsations that came with every pop, and made it a mission to unlock my entire body. It took me several years but I now possess the master skeleton key to my temple, and can crack every single joint, including every vertebrae in my spine and neck, all three knuckles on each finger, thumbs, wrists, elbows, shoulders, hips, knees, ankles, toes, and my personal favorite, the sternum. The fused cossacks and sacrum cannot crack, but the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar vertebra can, with the partially fused lower lumbar vertebra requiring the most bodywork to unfuse and unlock. Now as I stated, during this part of my personal yoga journey, I was unfamiliar with the concept of kundalini awakening, but had simply noticed and enjoyed the energetic sensation of joint popping so much that I made it a personal challenge to sufficiently stretch and loosen each joint until I could crack my whole body. For me, the final and most difficult vertebra to loosen were the lower lumbars, but I found that by hanging upside down using an inversion table, tree limb, or playground bar for spinal decompression, along with perfecting the halasana and kamapadasana poses, allowed me to unlock and crack every unfused vertebrae. Now for some people, kundalini may be triggered and rise without necessarily being able to crack every joint in their body. But for me, the moment I unlocked that final vertebrae of my spine was the beginning of my kundalini experience. I could instantly feel a fiery electrical sensation pulsating at the base of my spine, slowly gaining intensity and beginning to rise higher towards my back. I could instantly feel a fiery electrical sensation pulsating at the base of my spine, slowly gaining intensity and beginning to rise higher towards my lower back. I began to sweat, 
saw visual energy trails, and felt a steady building of euphoria reminiscent of coming up on a magic mushroom or LSD trip. As the electric fire continued rising towards my heart, I had several deep and transformative revelations about myself and my relationships, which caused extreme emotional fluctuations, from sobbing uncontrollably to laughing uncontrollably. When the energy reached my neck and continued ascending, there was a building internal pressure making it feel like my head was going to explode. Finally, the electrical fire engulfed my entire head and torso, and I had the extreme pleasure of experiencing for hours the highest high imaginable without taking any drugs. I laid on my bed euphoric, laughing hysterically, lightly flailing and flopping my arms and legs around, feeling the same kind of body high and hypersensitivity to touch characteristic of the drug ecstasy. The entire experience was like having the positive effects of all the best drugs in the world hitting you simultaneously and completely naturally. After several hours of perfect bliss, the feelings slowly subsided and normal life returned, but something deep within me changed forever thereafter. Within months I committed myself to veganism and ahimsa, nonviolence, which led me to voluntarism and ultimately to researching and discovering the conspiratorial control of humanity outlined ever since in my books and videos. It was then that I dedicated my life to exposing the truth and vowed never to stop my activism until the new world order dies, or I do. Anyone who knew me before and after my Kundalini experience in 2007 would confirm that a radical transformation occurred during this time where I fully came into my own. I felt debilitating pangs of empathy for the suffering of people in war-torn countries and animals in factory farms. It is this compassion for all sentient beings that led me to become the dedicated vegan voluntarist truth activist that I am today. There are theories that kundalini awakening increases endogenous endorphin, hormone, and DMT production, both temporarily and long-term, and that bursts of them could very well explain all the psychedelic, ecstatic phenomena. I also have my own pet theory that compressed vertebra and synovial gas buildup impedes the proper flow of cerebrospinal fluid and the many essential chemicals contained therein, and that this is why loosening and cracking the spine is so important for optimum health and kundalini awakening. The exact science and reasoning remains shrouded in mystery, but hopefully in the future, further experiments will enhance our understanding.